So, Josh, I appreciate you taking the, the time out of your busy day to do this. Uh, I know that you're um, you're on the road doing the dog thing. So uh, um, just go ahead and introduce yourself and, and tell us how you started with Hyder Terriers. How'd that come about? Yeah, so my name's Josh Neff. Um, I'm from bend oregon but i've kind of been all over the place these last few years out in eastern oregon and parts of montana but anywho um always grew up around dogs kind of grew up around border collies the last few years and cattle dogs my family owned a, a cattle ranch out in eastern oregon and grew up with a little jack russell cross kind of terrier and his name was blue and he you know he was kind of one of those little dogs that run under a porch and attack a raccoon or grab a cat and he was just a, a cool little terrier and anywho after he passed away I I wanted something bigger and I came across a guy which I got a shout out he's my buddy Seth Simpson he's out of Idaho and he had some some cool looking terrier dogs and I saw a dog he had that I liked and he I asked him what it was he said it was a hide hide a terrier and so it kind of put me on this quest and um I didn't know him that well at the time but uh I went looking for these hide tears. I was curious about who, what they were and where I could get one. And I couldn't really find many options for these dogs in the United States. And it pushed me through Facebook and through a lot of dog forums and on the internet and found them all over Europe. And eventually, you know, this is probably about nine months to 10 months of communicating with a, a hunter in Europe. He sold me a dog and that's Yuma. And, um, I brought Yuma in, I raised Yuma and he was a dog. I learned to kind of hunt these style of dogs with. And, you know, I didn't really come from a big hunting background. Um, so I learned everything with him and guys like Seth taught me how to coyote hunt. And he put a lot of time into me and I got Yuma going. And after that, it's been just kind of history. I've, my goal is to bring in more of them and they're about a mid size 40 to, to 50 pound terrier it should have markings that look like a yak terrier you know those black and tan markings they come in multiple coat lengths um short or wire coat and you can get they'll be solid red or like my male yuma he's a full brindle dog but um yeah they're hide terriers they were started in germany in 1971 so the the thing with hide terriers i think you know a lot of people there's there's not a lot of resources um and you know, I know there's that, that man, Carl Jacks, he runs, um, Carl, um, Jackal's old country blood. If he's got, he's got an article about Haida Terriers. There's a few other places you can find online, but so Haida Terriers were started in 1971 by name, by a guy named Hans Warner Jonk and a, and a man named Carl Heinz Markoff. Um, and they, these dogs, I mean, they were created after the Germans' beloved Yacht Terrier. I mean, everybody knows them. Those little black and tan dogs, right? It'll give you everything they've got. Um, and they wanted a dog that could be a boar specialist, and they basically wanted to build a larger Yacht Terrier. Um, they originally, these dogs were created in an area called Lower I pronounce it Lower Saxony. I think they might, the Germans might say it's Lower Saxonia. It's basically Northern, Northern Germany. Um, and these dogs were created up there with one line of Yacht Terriers. I forget the name of the line. I think it's called like the Rall, the Rall line, R-A-L-L-E line. It was, they were out, they were not standard Yacht Terriers. They weren't. They weren't 16 to 20 pound yacht tears. They were 30 pound yacht tears. So they were out of spec. And they first had those dogs and they needed something a little more, a little more bigger, a better handle on them. And so they took Hans, went over. Hans was in the military and he, he had access, I think, to the descendants from what I was told from a buddy of his um, that were guard prison guard style airedales that came from world war ii um bite work protection lines and he brought one of those over 
And that's what they started the hides with. And the F1 cross was that bred to these larger, these larger yacht terriers over there in that lower Saxony area. And they started catching pigs with them and kind of fine combing the dogs from there. And eventually they started to add bull types. They needed more of a catch dog bred into them. And there was no set race. And that's the thing. I think a lot of people look at these dogs, um, Sean, and they say, oh, a, y- a hide from what I've read is an English Bull Terrier, Yacht Terrier, Airedale Cross. Um, you know, I've got a female in the truck with me right now. And if you ran a DNA test on her, she's going to come out 50% Yacht Terrier. 50, she come out 50% Yacht Terrier, 25% Airedale Irish Terrier type and the, those two breeds and then she's um she's got american pit she's got alano and she also has english bull and so in the beginning you know there really wasn't a, a race or a, a breed for bull type selected i think now today a lot of people like the english bull terrier cross it's a, a little more of an open-minded dog yeah they're a little more you know i think they're a little more handler friendly they, they have that bite that, you know, you can catch a pig with them. But um, there's multiple lines of, of hide a you can get involved in. You go over to Europe, you know, I'm my favorite one. And this is just, you know, my opinion. It doesn't. But my favorite line of dogs it comes from a guy named Ingo Bauer. And he, he kind of has different terriers from other breeders. And he's made his own combinations with. And he's got he's got a dog that's got. Um, Arn Pohlmeyer's line and those dogs and Arn Pohlmeyer know him personally he got in these dogs 20 years ago and his story is you know 20 years ago there were really no Haida Terriers even though they were built in 1971 there was only a few guys calling them Haida Terriers and he he got dogs from Carl before he died and Hans he, he picked up some dogs and he went looking for dogs that would go back to 71 and he found them and he started to produce his lines. He's probably produced the most litters over there, if that says anything or not. And I've personally got to handle his, a dog from him and they're, uh, they're short fuse and they're just hot. You know, they're, they're strong dogs. Um, my dog on is from him. Uh, I have a dog from Ingo that's, a mixture of different lines and it's a much more open-minded dog. So these dogs are kind of built in a sense based off what the hunter is looking for. You know, there's not a, a a big restriction on like what is and what's not. It's more, some guys, you know, think they can put it together. And I think the overall goal is to make a dog who is bred run to catch. It should, it should go out, find some, find some wild boar and it should be able to zone in and catch one. It should, that's, that's what they want. It should lock in on one. That was the goal. That's interesting. So there's really no set standard of it's, it's what tough. percentage of of whatever mix they have. It just it just depends on the line and where you're getting it from and all of that. You know, I will say this from what I've been told, and it seems very um, the general consensus is that. A Haida Terrier is 50% Yacht Terrier. It's, it should be, the base of the dog should be 50% Yacht Terrier. The rest should be 25% Airedale. And you'll see, you know, on some of them, they'll see Irish in them as well, which I don't understand why they put Irish in them. I just think, I, I don't understand why they did that, but they did, you know. Show, there's, there's a few other guys who have put in Showline Irish Terriers for some reason, but they're in there. Um, but it should be 50% Yacht Terrier, 25% Airedale, or a mix between Airedale and Irish, and then 25% Bull type. That is that is basically the combination of a Haida Terrier. Now, some guys think you shouldn't be able to make them anywhere in the world. Some so There's some guys, you know, the Germans are known for their dogs, and there's a few guys that want to see it become a breed, and they don't. They don't want everybody just whipping these up and batching them in their backyards. They, they want them to stay in Germany and they want them to come from those old lines that go back to 71 to create this, create this type and to see it become a breed. And I know there's guys working for that, but it's, it's definitely been a challenge for them due to the popularity and 
people kind of making their own versions and their own styles. You can look at one line and you might see a different look than another man's line of Hyda Terrier. But they're not a recognized breed. They have an association in Europe. Um, the Lithuanians have really been crushing it with these dogs. They've been They've been making combinations that the Germans haven't made. I've got a friend who lives in Lithuania. He's catching moose with five dogs. Wow. He doesn't have anything. He's not using hounds. He's not using Russian Leica. He's not using, you know, how we do in America. We've got some cur dogs, and then we've got a catch dog. He He's running five hides out catching a moose, you know, hundreds and hundreds of yards away in a, in a bog, or he's running down a red stag with his dogs. I mean, they'll go. Um, they have the opportunity to hunt that way and they've proven to be run to catch on various game. And what, what are some of the things that the Lithuanians do or doing that the, the, the Germans aren't, I would say, and this is also kind of my opinion. This is not, you know, it's, I have a language barrier between both, both of these, um, countries and from what Mm. I've but the Lithuanians look like they're really working together to build, build, build these dogs. Um, my buddy Zilvinas goes to Germany. He'll pick up dogs from Ingo. He'll pick up dogs from Arn. He'll pick up dogs from Walter Brethren's. He'll pick up dogs from Andreas Penn's. He's, he's buying multiple different um, lines of dogs to build them together and kind of make combinations that these other breeders haven't wanted to do you know they they're very proud of the dogs they build you know when they build something they don't they don't want to just go use the other guys stock to put into theirs really right Um, there's a few guys who are known as i would say who are making verified dogs that are all representatives and hide terrors you've got my buddy arn polmeyer he's thrown the most litters he i would say he makes the most wild dogs as far as hunting goes like they there are dogs you can't hunt bears with. They, they'd run in and grab a hold. Um, mm. You know, they're pure run to catch boar dogs. He takes them down to Spain just to hunt down there on some big boar. And he had a dog named Willie. And he told me stories about Willie. And he's like, I tested Willie with pure, pure American pit bull terriers and other dogs. And he said he, Willie catches just like any pure catch dog. He said he really could catch anything. He could, he would always go for the head. He would never catch from behind only he's he's like he's one of the best dogs i've ever had you know i've had he's had yacht terriers that would run behind a pig and grab it by the back of its leg not not get on its ear or grab its face you know and he said these were much more catch dogs that could track and and put it together and um willie yeah willie was taken down to spain to hunt boar he goes all over the place to specifically hunt boars but the guys like in lithuania i'm sorry to just jump all over the place man but um the guys in Lithuania, they've proven to hunt everything with the dogs. They they don't just hunt them boar. They'll take, like I said, my buddy will take them out. And he'll catch moose. He'll catch red stag. He'll catch different types of deer, boar, badgers, everything. Um, you know, he's he's made them pretty handy. He sends me videos of them raiding beaver dens and retrieving on the water. Um, they'll do it all. That's interesting. So let's let's uh, let's talk about your what kind of dogs have you owned up until the point you got a hide or Terry? You kind of spoke a little bit about the dog that you had previously, but what other experiences have you had with dogs and, and, and what were yeah. they? So my family, like I said, my grandfather had a big cattle ranch. We've always had cow dogs around mm-hmm. McNabs, border collies, just cow, cow running dogs. And I always mm-hmm. thought and working dogs were cool, man. These dogs would ride on a four wheeler and then hop off and go, gather cattle and push them to you and i was just amazed like you know we are so it just felt so instinctual and primitive almost that we were using dogs this way and yeah, yeah. that kind of got me started but i met a man who um rolled into my, our ranch driveway one day on a snowy morning and uh he's my still my friend today his name's john and he had a, a box in the back of his truck and that thing was jumping off the ground and howling and, and hooting. And I was like, good Lord, what's in there? And he's like, those are my hounds. And I've only heard of hounds, never messed with them. And he's like, you want to go run a cat? And I'm like, cat, like, what do you mean? And he's like, let's go catch a, let's go catch a bobcat. And I said, well, hell, that sounds like a good time. I hopped in the rig and 
we drove miles on a road, cut a track and turned some dogs out. And about, I think it was maybe 45 minutes to an hour later, I was walking into a tree with hounds. They looked like chainsaws at the bottom of that tree, ripping the, tw- ripping the limbs off it, a small pine tree and just chewing at it and wailing and baying and barking up. And there was a big old Tom Bobcat in that tree. And I, I feel like ever since then, I thought that was so cool. You know, that was kind of, that was my first day on with hunting dogs. And these hounds came from a guy named Willie Sutherland out of Northern California. His dad started this line of hounds and I know Willie and he's 85 years old today and he's still hunting hounds, walks into the tree with his dogs. So with all your experiences with, you know, kind of a, a higher drive dog that, that, has a purpose what are some of the things that you've noticed about these dogs that um have surprised you or or um have taken you back a little bit oh yeah so with hides um i've got three that i mean the off switch is just amazing like i was not completely expecting that you know border collies are handy dogs but I think they're also high anxiety dogs too. They can be a little anxious, you know, if they're, I, I don't think they're meant ever for an urban setting. They do great in farm, you know, rural areas, running cattle, actually doing what they're meant to do. But, you know, I've, I've had buddies who've even had border collies just as pets. And it's just like, they seemed anxious. And these dogs that I have no anxiety to them at all. You know, they'll, I've been on a road trip with them the last few days and we've gone 600 miles and they sleep in this pickup with me. But if, you know, if there's a raccoon in a ditch on the side of the road, they're ready to go to war. They'll wake up immediately and get down there and get to it. You know, like they, they will relax inside. They're not a dog. I would say you would just leave out in your yard or in your house. But if you're there present, they'll just, the off switch is amazing. I did not truly expect that. I kind of researched yacht terriers and talk to people and some people tell me yacht terriers have handles some tell me they're they call them the trouble terrier they're not a they need to be supervised or they're in a kennel when you're not using them and i didn't really have an expectation completely but i was surprised by the handle of the hide it's you know i can tell my dog yuma to sit and i'll leave him in an aisle at home depot and i'll go walk around and come back and yuma will still be sitting there waiting to be released um he handles great Um, He listens, he minds, super loyal dog, is enthusiastic to have a relationship with a human. Um, You can control him, you know, I could put him on a a coyote on the ground or a wounded coyote on a hunt. And if I need him to back up, I can call him off and he'll back up. Um, He has an off switch and he minds and that I think speaks so highly of these dogs. Yeah, that's what's always kept me from um, owning one is, is you know, a, a terrier type hunting terrier type dog is, is, is the off switch. So that's pretty cool to hear. Yeah. And the things I would say, I mean, you know, with the mixing of dogs, um, you know, bull types, they can, these dogs, like I tell, I, I told the guys who bought pups for me, I mean, they won't be bullied around, man. Like if a dog, you know, if a dog comes ripping in, somebody has a reactive dog, you're someplace and you have your pup on a leash, like they don't get bullied around Yuma. You know, I took Yuma out on my ranch and even at six months old, you know, he's got mature border collies posturing up and wanting to put him in check and, and swing on him, you know? And he was like, he would not be for it. He, he's like, I will fight you right now. So he's one of those dogs that you have to have a relationship with. You have to work with it to make sure he tolerates other dogs or you could have a, you know, an issue later on in life if you don't put a good handle on them, but they just, they're strong willed and, um, yeah, they're, they're everything you expect, I think in a yacht terrier, but bigger with a, with a great handle. Can you talk about what they're trying to, uh, create a uniform standard in Germany and what, what do you know what, they're hoping yeah. to 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 create as far as that standard is and I can, and talk can you give specifics bit. yeah i can talk a little some friends with a gal named lydia and she um she is part of the hide terrier um association there in germany and their biggest thing they i mean they they want to make a breed out of these eventually however um you know you you've have someone over here who's using 
who's kind of making their version and this person over there is making their version. And it is hard to get people together because it is such, it was developed as such a type, you know, like that's, that's what they, they, they're working on trying to get these breeders together to actually focus in on, Hey, let's, let's work together. Let's build this, this dog together. So that's more universal where you're not seeing, you know, you're not seeing a little different look here and there, you know, they want to, they want to fine comb these dogs. It's going to come down to black and tan dogs. There's not going to be brindle dogs like my male Yuma. It's going to come down to, you know, it's, it's to build a breed, I think really does take quite some time and effort into doing that. Um, that's what they would love to do. I mean, if you, you know, for the most part, I'll send you photos over, but you can see a distinct look in these dogs kind of all the way across but you'll see certain lines might just be a little broader or you'll you'll see just a little difference right you know not they're not like yacht terriers or airedales where you can you can completely tell and i think they're only you know 50 years old right i mean how long does it take to make a breed originally you know what is what is the story and i think rootstock is always kind of sloppy and messy until people kind of get it together and really fine tune and Arn Polmeyer, I know he's been line breeding his dogs over there in Germany for the last 18 years. And every dog that comes out of his yard, they all look very similar. You know, they look like they're their own breed already. Um, but that's their goal. They, they definitely are working together. They're trying to, to select who and what is going to be accepted in. I know right now, like I've heard that brindle dogs are ruled out. I've got a brindle dog. I mean, I don't really care too much that they're going to be ruled out i get it but it's going to be black and tan coats you know that's one thing that's huge for them with the the bull type blood in here they're gonna not be breeding for that color and i think that really speaks on german dog laws though it's illegal to own some bull types over there you can't really own an american pit bull terrier in germany um or certain dogs like alano the presses there i think you have to have a license or something you know but it's not just a right you can have those kind of dogs there hence why they want to stick with the bull terrier huh yeah i think that's why they use the bull terrier mm -hmm. and that's why he became popular just because those german dog laws and mm -hmm. you'll see now like and i think that's why a lot of people fixate on oh a hide a hide a terrier is a um yacht terrier airedale english bull and it, and you know that but when you get back to the history of these dogs, a lot of guys slipped that Alano blood in from Spain. There was a famous dog that came up. Um, Arn, Arn bred this dog. His name's Thor. And I've, I'll send you a photo of Thor, but he just looks like a rank catch dog. You can tell he's got a pit bull in him. You can tell he's got, he's kind of a mixed up, hard looking dog. He's got scars on him. Um, you know, I think he lived to be about five years old, but he's a huge foundation of the Hida Terrier. He made a lot of Hida Terriers have that catch style. I mean, guys like Walter, he's a very known breeder. You know, they, they paid Arn for stud fees to get that, that kind of catch dog blood. And it's just history. It's in all the dogs. Thor's, I mean, Thor's in a lot of pedigrees. A lot of the people over there in Lithuania have um, that dog in his pedigree too, and that's kind of one thing. You know, you, it's just, it's just, it's just history, right? I mean, they're gonna, they're gonna change, and they're gonna hopefully get this dog to become a breed, and I hope it works for them. But the beginning, it was just about performance, as every dog breed should be, and always should hold that standard. I know things change, and people drift and do the whole show stuff, but. You know, it was just about making a dog for a job. It, you know, what they use fox terriers, Welsh terriers, you know, in the beginning. And they, they whittled down and they built a dog that was super handy hunting dog. Um, I think that's kind of what they want to happen for the hide. They want it to be like their next yacht terrier. Their, net, their bigger yacht terrier. I know a lot of guys over there have left yacht terriers they they like the hides more they're they're not digging for a game they're they're catching boar and they're catching game on the ground and i think there's a lot of honor and and their and their culture and their and the way they hunt and for them to see it become a breed i mean if that means we've got to exclude this color out and that or whatever you know 
they take a lot of honor in their dogs and to them it's worth it. But I totally, I see what you mean. The more we keep fine tuning and, and, and keep pushing, we, we kind of almost isolate ourselves from more options or just, you know, we're not making it, uh, we're not, it's not it kind of, it always seems to drift away from performance in the end once we start controlling so much. Yeah. And then also it, it, it ends up affecting things like health. I mean, you look at the, you look at the European Doberman. Um, and I know like, you know, over there and I've, I've been running some, some health genetic tests on these dogs and they're, they're seeing some stuff in hides. I mean, in the beginning, you know, in the last probably 10 years, we've been able to test dogs, right. on like these Embark panels and, and figure out what, what's inside a dog's genetics, you know, for disease. And, um, back in the day, I mean, Ingo, he's my favorite breeder. He's like my German father. He got me into Yuma and I love all the dogs in his yard. They're amazing. I've got to hunt them there in Germany. And, um, you know, he, he never tested a dog for health. You know, if a dog went blind or a dog had an issue, I mean, we know how these dogmen would handle it back then, you know, they didn't, it was, that was it. They were just removed from their, from their, their stock. And, you know, now we have this option to kind of screen through dogs and make better decisions. You know, when I brought my dogs and I was looking for PLL, you know, I know I heard that these dogs can get it from Yacht Terrier blood. And so I threw a test and made sure none of my dogs had PLL. But, you know, as you know, I'm already three years in and now we're looking for other things that I guess these dogs can carry. Um, and that, you know, to me, it's, I mean, I talked to an old vet and he's like, the harder you look for health, the more you will find. And he's like, you know, so it's kind of like, where, where do we draw the line? Right. I think if it's, if if the dog is going to perform, continue it. But if it's something that's going to ruin the performance of the dog and the line of dogs, then it's, it's not worth to put it out there. Yeah. They're just, it's a, it's an educational tool. It isn't a, uh, it isn't the Bible, you know what I mean? It's not black or white. And I think that's where, uh, I think people get frustrated or or they lose faith in their own programs is that they, they're not looking outside the box and realizing that it's just a guide. It isn't, yeah, it, it isn't the word it's anyway. Um, can you talk about your experiences in the, in the hunt field and how they, how they've reacted and and just kind of the specifics on that and what's been really a joy to see. Yeah. Um, Hunting them. I mean, up front, like I had one pup, um, Yuma, I brought him in and I just, I mean, honestly, I raised him like a pet at first. I didn't put a lot of pressure on the dog. Um, I think, you know, I wanted to really get a good handle on him and, and build a relationship and, um, as a hunting dog and I, I value my dogs. They're not just dogs that live in my yard and I take them out and they go back to my yard. I'm, I'm around them every day, you know? And so I, I raised this pup and I think about five or six months of age, we started really started to kind of focus more on hunting. You know, I'd, I'd drag a pellet out and maybe hide it, you know, 600 yards away or something on this ranch I was on or, put it in a bush and I'd let Yuma go work it up and track it. And then, you know, eventually I was shooting coyotes for Yuma and, and wounding them or shooting them and try not to just wound them. But, um, and I'd have Yuma track them up and find them dead. And we started there and he was very reliable and about eight months old. I had some barn cats on this ranch and that dog just started putting it to my barn cats. And I was like, all right, I got to protect this dog from his drive, you know? He, I didn't want him fighting things, getting hurt. I just wanted to build him up right. But I mean, eight months old, just grabbed one of my big barn cats off a post and just killed it, you know? And I was like, good Lord. And I, that's an experience I, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't have that with border collies, you know? I was just like, holy crap, right? And I learned a lot about these dogs and the way they work and what you can do with them. And I, I kind of broke that stuff with them a little bit. But at the same time, I didn't want to break their natural genetics and their drive to find game and want them to always just be dog safe and good with other dogs. But, you know, they're so highly motivated to hunt. I mean, once, once those collars come out and you put the garments on them, 
they know they know we're going hunting and they'll and I as I tell people Yuma Yuma's desperate to find something when he was I remember he was six months old I was walking him down the trail when I was outside of Bend Oregon and he was good he was he's good off leash he'd hang around and he jumped uh he jumped some mule deer right next to me and um it was a huge mistake I had made and a lesson I learned but I mean he took off with these mule deer and he didn't have a, a tracking collar on but I chased after that dog for about a mile and found him on a golf course chasing mule deer around and he couldn't catch him, you know, but he was just still hanging out there trying to work him up. And I learned right then and there is tracking collars from here on out. Now you're, you're not a little pup anymore. Even if you, even if you are, you're, you're mentally not one, you want to catch something. And so they'll, they'll go, they'll, they'll range out, they'll track. I mean, I've, I've used them. I've ran them with the hounds my friend has. I've caught bobcats with Yuma and a couple hounds. Um, I've taken Yuma. I, I made him into a decoy dog. You know, I was really inspired by this guy named Seth Simpson, like I said, in Idaho. And he, he was, he's such a nice guy. He took me in and, and taught me and showed me so much and, and did way more than I probably even deserved. But he's become such a good friend to me and taught me how to decoy and so I made Yuma a decoy dog and Yuma would work up coyotes and bring them to me and I'd shoot them. And if the shot was bad, you know, Yuma would run out there and grab that wounded coyote and get it on the ground and keep it from going anywhere. And those dogs will hang their teeth and they're not, they're not going to bay. I haven't had a situation where they bay yet and they just, they just want it. We're talking some of the, to of those guys over, over there in Europe, uh, what has been some of the differences that they seem compared to the Yog Terry, even though it has, you know, 50% of that blood, but what, what do they like about them more about the Yogs just besides just the size? I, I think the point for them, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's really not objective. It, they wanted to make a boar, boar dog. And so the point for these, you know, they, my guys over there kind of, joke around and call those yak terriers the trouble terriers you know if one got off the leash it'd be out of your yard it'd be gone it'd be dead somewhere it'd be in the burrow of a you know with a badger and you would never see it again kind of how they described it to me and and um these dogs are you know you could have one like yuma yuma my i lived on a ranch like i was telling you and yuma just hung out on the porch when we were messing when i was chilling you know with cow dogs I didn't have to just tie Yuma up or I didn't have to put him in a kennel. I know some guys might scoff and be like, oh, I wouldn't do that to a hunting dog. But Yuma, Yuma's a very trainable dog. He knew to stay around the house and he'd just hang out. And once the collars came out, he knew we were going hunting and he'd load up in the truck and we'd go hunting. But I mean, that's, I think there's a different handle to these dogs, which makes them special. And I, it's not universal completely yet with these different lines. Like my, my female Anna, she handles a little different. She handles a little rougher. She can take a lot more. Um, she, she doesn't have the control Yuma and Elko and, and Selma have, but she's, she's, um, she's good in other aspects too, that they might not have, you know, every, every dog has flaws, right? Every dog has strengths. But the handle, the handle on these dogs is what speaks most when, you know, I sent, I, I threw a litter and I threw this litter only because I wanted to make them accessible for other hunters here. I, this wasn't for me to make money and get them all over the place. It was really, I, you know, I want to see them succeed as a hunting dog. And I know they're going to be great. And I got them out to some guys who had yak terriers and they, and personally, they've told me, I don't know if I want to get yak terriers again. I really like how these dogs are. They're so relaxed. They're so nice in the rig. You can take them in the house. They're not launching at my flat screen with movement. You know, they, they can chill out. Um, and I'm sure some yak terriers can, but I know guys who have Eastern European yak terriers and they're, they're a weapon, you know, they're a tool. They don't come in the house. Where they got the name hide there for massive sow hunts. Mm -hmm. They would, they would run a huge packs, packs of these dogs and they could, you know, you could cast, you could put out like, I don't know, 10 or 15 hunting terriers at once and turn them loose on a, on a large herd of sows out in these hide fields and, that's where they got the name, the hide by the hide flower in the fields. They'd run through and they had to start catching pigs. And that's what they were designed to do. And um, they evolved eventually. And other people took them places. I mean, I've got a dog named Elko. And 
her uncle's dead now, but he'd catch anything. Um, he'd catch moose. He'd catch elk. He'd catch anything you wanted him to. You just put him on the track, and it was amazing. I, I, he, he spoke. I mean, he he was a cool dog, and he didn't live long because of how catchy he was. But you know, I've got videos of him fighting huge badgers. I've got I've got videos of this dog hanging on the front end of a a red stag, and the stag's trying to gore him, and he's holding on the head of it. You know, like they would they would catch anything they could. Um, I think there are also dogs that might be smart enough to realize. You know, I would hope that these dogs that I have wouldn't grab a bear. I think from what I've seen them and how they act, Yuma and Elko would maybe bay a bear. I don't know if that's true, and I've never tested that. But um, at the same time, like they're they're not dogs that want to die on game completely, but. They're, I wouldn't call them complete suicide jockeys, but they definitely want to hold it and catch it and hang their teeth in it. And so they've, I was impressed that they would run moose and run stag, especially deer will go for a ways, I feel like. And they've proven to do that well. And I love how they work coyotes. I mean, they'll, they can handle a few coyotes at once and those coyotes will be all over them. And they're getting pressured and then they're putting pressure back on those coyotes. And like I said, if I put a bad shot in, you know, and accidentally wound a coyote, those dogs are on the throat of that coyote and they're, and it's not going anywhere. They want them to succeed in America. I mean, the guy who I, I consider having the first real hide of terriers in America is one of my best friends. Uh, his name's Truett. Truett Harris out of West Virginia. He imported five dogs starting in like 2010. Um, and he, you know, he had a house in Hawaii and he was going to go hunt pigs and it didn't work out, but he brought in five dogs and some of those dogs are in the South. Um, Arn, they, they wanted to see them successful here. I mean, I know the Germans have a lot of respect for our, our hunting culture and that we have all these different landscapes and environments to hunt. You know, you can be hunting in Florida for hogs and then we have, you know, what, what can we do out in Wyoming or or other places we have so much ground and, and so many ways to test dogs and i think they knew eventually that they would come over here and i've been shown nothing but um kindness from most of these breeders and they've helped me so much to to make this possible and um they they want to see the dogs succeed here they you know i've got an eight i've got to be eight months nine months old he's owned by a guy named roy out of idaho and he took that pup hunting down in texas he went down to uncle earl's and then took that dog hunting in texas and he said that pup from yuma and anna ran in on a pig never seen one before caught it right by the head with his plot hounds didn't hesitate and you know i sent that over to ingo my guy who bred my dogs and you know that's they take a lot of honor in that they think that's really cool to see their dogs doing what they do in germany over here well, that's cool. That's that's good to know that um, yeah, they're about it. And so, what would uh, talk about your first breeding experience? What what was that like? And how was how did the mom respond? And the the whole whelping res uh, experience? Yeah, those um, that was fun. I mean, that was a learning curve for me. Like, I mean, just so everyone listening, like, I'm no, I'm not a dog fancier. I'm not, you know, I'm. I'm just a dude who saw something who he wanted to go for. And I took the time I flew to Europe. I, you know, I've, I put in a lot of time translating with these guys and learning about these dogs. And eventually I had people who were interested in the dogs I brought over. And so I was like, you know what, I've got a male, I've got a female and people are reaching out. Let's run an experiment. That's how we're going to know if they're going to work out here or not. You know, I think they're worth it. Um, you know, I, had two dogs that were over two years old. They've seen game, they've hunted game. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to slap that big label. They're proven dogs, right? I mean, they, but they've done enough and I believe in the genetics and I'm new to this and I wanted to make an opportunity for others to check it out. And so I threw a litter of pups and those, you know, I, um, I did it all myself. I, had to dock their tails and everything. And that was a whole experience I will never forget. I mean, it was fun to have them. I'm not really into, I'm not going to raise a litter of pups every year. I mean, it is work, you know, but 
those pups came out kind of just like I was hoping they would. They, the mother is 55 pounds. She looks like I said, like a wire coated pit bull with Airedale markings. And she's got jaws of death for a head. She's got a huge head on her. And I mean, you've never seen teeth on a dog like this. That's the one thing all my buyers tell me that like, I've never seen teeth so enlarged on a, on a, on a dog. And, um, these pups just came out very confident. Um, I joked around when, before they left, and I told the buyers, I was like, you guys are lucky that these dogs is their skin's tougher than their teeth right now. Cause they're, they're, they're learning, they're communicating with each other. They're, they're roughing each other up and, and they're, and their stall that I had for them. And I mean, they, I put a coyote pellet out at eight weeks old to see what they thought. And they all just hung teeth in it and were ripping it apart. They just, they just want it. It's in, it's ingrained in them, you know, to hunt. And these little pups, I mean, they're successful. I I sent one down to California. He's with a government hunter. He called me and told me, he's like, I'm done buying Airedales. I wasted money on Airedales and he wanted another dog. And he told me he took it out with some hounds and caught a lion with that, that seven month old pup from me. And he's, you know, he removes lions and coyotes for the government down there. And he's like, it's one of the best pups he's ever raised. And so I think that speaks a lot, you know, and I didn't have enough experience to, to tell the world like, Hey, these are the coolest dogs or these are great hunting dogs or this, but having these guys with more experience who took a chance on me and, and also had an interest in the dogs that I brought in, I think, shows that they're they can be successful here and i had a pretty positive experience with the pups the mother did great she was a great mother um every pup lived she threw nine of them made her the best welt box too i mean i turned in the ritz carlton for her and you know what she did she went i had a big i i have a, i had a big barn and multiple horse stalls and i didn't have any horses in there and i took a 12 by 12 horse stall and turned it into a where she was going to whelp a litter and I built this sweet box for her and you know what she did she decided to get out of that box and dig through the through the straw and through the material in that horse stall and she dug herself a pit and she and those dogs landed in the dirt when I got back wow. she was those pups in the dirt and I mean that's just instinctual you know yeah very much so and they they're such cool pups I mean the one I the one I wanted to keep, I sent to a guy in Idaho, and he's turned that dog into a flipping legend. He named him, he named him Adolf, and Adolf is just like his mother, but a little bit a little bit leggier like his father, and he can move. And he took him down hunting in Texas, and he caught a boar, 900 yards out with two plot hounds, I believe, with that with that pup, and he wasn't even a year old. Um, and a, it wasn't like a big rank crazy boar, but for a dog's first time, you know, never yeah. seen game. It was like, it was like, he's been doing it a while. And that was really cool to hear. And, um, everybody's having different experiences with their pups. I sent one to a guy down in Texas who is out of Alpine and he's a hunting guide. And he's like, you know, dogs for me, Josh used to, you know, if it didn't work, it left or if it, you know, I, I didn't really get too attached. He's like, it's been a long time since I felt this way about a dog. I can't, I can't let this dog go. She just, she loves me so much and she wants, she's so enthusiastic to go with me to work every day. And she's tracking up odd ads for my clients and mule deer and other game that people poorly shoot. And that's her job to blood trail. And, um, none of these pups are a year old and they're already building hunting experiences and core memories with their handlers. And, I think that's one of the coolest things ever, you know. If you were going to write the standard, what would that standard be as far as like the structure, height, and weight, and all that? It'd be a 40 to 50 pound dog. Um, you know, I go a lot off of what the German standard are. I wouldn't have these, I wouldn't get to have these dogs if it wasn't for those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, also taking a chance on me like i said i came from cow dogs and not a whole lot of dog experience i was just a guy with a dream who wanted to learn and put it together and make it happen and i've changed my whole life to do this and i'm having so much fun but you know for me like i want i i think a well-bred dog and i want my dogs my dogs for for me i think it's about history i think it's about 
you know, they're German dogs. They're, they came from a really small area up in Northern Germany. Um, the dogs I have go back to 1971. They've got, they've got that Arn Pohlmeyer, um, Lanzimut blood in them. And those dogs all trace back to 71 with Car- Carl and, and Hans. And to me, that's huge. I, I want that authenticity in my dogs. Like I don't want, you know, just something that was whipped up to look just like them. I want it to go back to the history and the meaning behind the dogs. Um, I want a dog that's 40 to 50 pounds, either a tight, tight coat or a little bit of a wiry kind of bearded coat on a dog. Um, red or black, just like the Germans have it. I think that's important. Um, you can't just have dogs that are all over the place in color. Or they're nothing. I mean, to me, at least they're, they're just, a, you know, you got to have some sort of a standard, right? And if you're asking how I would run them, I, I like that look of them. They, they look sharp They're They look tough. They look sturdy. They're, they're not dogs you just walk up to and you're all over them. You know, they're not like a golden retriever. They, they, they have a, a look to them where, you know, they, they're strong, sturdy terriers. And for me though, also that performance is huge. Like I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have these dogs if I wasn't using them. And so I think it's really important that we keep that drive and they're open-minded with other dogs. They're willing to work with other dogs and they understand and accept your rules and your yard and what you have for them. To me, that, that's how I want it, you know should be able to run down game. They should be able to, you know, they shouldn't bay a raccoon. They shouldn't, they should catch a pig. They should, they should be trainable and, and should be able to handle them. And if you need them to get off of something, if, you know, if you're rolling up and there's a porcupine on the ground and you don't want your dog hitting it, telling them to back out of there and, and listen to you, they shouldn't, they should be able to be controlled. But once it's time to go to war, they should, they should be in there for you. Do you uh, foresee some of these dogs if maybe they, they, they don't fulfill exactly what a hunter would need in a hunting dog, uh, being able to do other things like that uh, require a little bit of drive and athleticism? You know, I, I've seen people use them. I've got a buddy in Europe who he turned one into a drug dog. It just tracks and looks for narcotics at an airport, I think, in Frankfurt. Um, I mean, they they can be trained and used in multiple situations. Um, I, what one guy does with their dogs versus me. I mean, I, I think they should always be looked at as hunting dogs. They're bred for hunting. They're bred for that work environment. If you want to take the time to make them mess around and do bite work with them. I mean, there's other dogs that were bred for that. And so I think, you know, these these dogs were bred for hunting, use them for hunting. They'll, they're also friendly enough to live within your home. They're friendly enough to have around children and babies and other animals. And, um, they'll understand your rules. Um, a, a guy essentially could go out and do all sorts of things with these dogs. You know, I think, I think a dog would thrive with someone who also just had a high active life. Who's running around the mountains or running dirt trails or mountain biking. And they just wanted an active terrier. I'm sure I'm sure it's possible, but to give these dogs what they deserve, I think they gotta they gotta be chasing things. They gotta they've gotta see, you know, fur. They've gotta see wild game. I think it just makes sense, and it all comes together for them full circle once they once they live that life. I mean, Yuma, I that dog will play frisbee. Elko will play mm-hmm. frisbee. They'll play ball. They'll. I've I've turned them out with cow dogs and and played ball with them and. They, they play just as hard. I mean, Yuma can, Yuma can climb a six foot tall fence and he's up and over. I mean, he's athletic. I mean, there's, I'm amazed by how much of an athletic abilities these dogs hold. I mean, you couldn't get them to do all sorts of things. I'm sure he could have fun doing agility. Have you ever seen, um, have you ever seen like how Malinois handle where they, they, they have that, that look where they look up at the handler the whole time they're weaving in and out of their legs or healing and they're walking with the person never never looking anywhere but directly up with their neck at the person Mm -hmm. you know these dogs you can train them to do that too exactly i mean they they'll focus like that forever i mean they are very enthusiastic about being handled um Mm -hmm. that's one thing that my 
a bunch of my buyers are like, man, the guy out of California said, this is like a terrier that handles like a border collie. He's my best friend. He rides in the pickup. I hop on my mule. We go, we go look for coyotes with my other dogs and he, he hangs close. He ranges far. He, he just wants to be there with me. I mean, he's not just a, and he, and he told me he'd owned yacht terriers before. And, you know, I think he said the dogs just seem more motivated to get out in the field than to have more of that handler relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the thing you can you can kind of I feel like almost do a lot with these dogs I mean maybe it's that extra bull blood that that creates that that or that Airedale something yeah something there yeah Airedales Airedales have bull blood in them too so that's a <laughs> exactly yeah um yeah another you know another reason I, I asked that question is because you know uh with all this legislation and, and the way things are going, um, you know, uh, are, so what are some of the regulations there in Germany uh, as far as like hunting is concerned? Are, are, you know, are they, I, I'm just amazed that they're able to even have hunting dogs still. Yeah, I know. Right. That's what I'm like. I'm, I'm kind of in the place where like, if people want these dogs and they want one in, like, get a hold of me give me a call i can bring a dog in probably a lot cheaper than you can just with my connections and you know being able to go over there and stay for free with these hunters but yeah they're they're losing their rights over there it's pretty sad um you know their their hunt their hunting styles change when i hunted in germany it was it was fun i enjoyed it i love the the community behind it i mean we you basically go to this big meetup and you have like 60 to 70 people there and it's like this huge celebration and the dogs are in the trailers shaking and barking and excited and they're ready to hunt, but they talk about the hunt. They talk about the direction the drive will be and where we'll be driving boar and where we'll be, what we're expecting. And they talk about what's legal, what's not. And <coughs> excuse me, but, um, you know, they don't have the hunting freedom we get to have. We don't, you know, we, you know, in Texas or all these different States, like today I can go out in Oregon and I can grab the dogs and, we'll go or whatever. We can go look around and I can go shoot coyotes all day long. And you, you don't get to live like that in Europe, really. You don't get to just go hunting when you want to go hunting. It seems like it's a lot more controlled and you, you have like a manager, almost like a guy who is monitoring what you're doing when you're hunting. And it goes for the dogs too. And certain dogs can hunt. I don't think you can just take any dog out to hunt. Um, they've, they've have to, meet some sort of requirements um i forget exactly i wish i this is one thing i need to get more educated in but i mean when i was there you know ingo he when he to become a hunter it took him six months and then to become a dog guide i think it became a it was a longer process to, for him he he's he's has an established hunting pack and that's what these guys who have hunting dogs is they have hunting packs and you can um you can hire them out for a hunt to come drive game for you. And these guys will get up, the shooters will get up in the trees and these stands and shoot game as they, as the dogs drive them to them. And then there's other, other hunts like a corn hunt where it's just dogs running through the corn, catching pigs, just like we would do down in Texas, chasing, chasing hogs with cur dogs, you know, they're just running them till they can catch them. But they have a few seasons and, their freedom's definitely a lot different. I can't speak fully on it all, but I think it changes the way the dogs are. I mean, and like we talked about earlier, their dog laws, you know, they can't just, you know, we got guys here that have a few curs and they've got a pit bull. You don't, you can't just roll in with a pit bull in Germany and go catch a pig. That's not, that's forbidden. That's outlawed for them. Um, and it's a huge reason why they want to breed the those brindle colors out of these dogs as well because they don't want they don't want to lose any more of i think their hunting rights so i think that brindle coloration is they think it it is a, a pit bull color you know or a, a fighting dog color <laughs> yeah it's not it's not about what the dog's ability is and that's how i am kind of in parts i mean the dog is its ability not what it completely looks like but um so that's huge i mean that's why it's, you know, black and tan, um, probably more focused on English bull terrier versus American pit bull or Alano. But there's a few guys there that still have that old blood, like the dogs I have, 
Elko, Anna, who've got that Alano stuff in them. And, you know, now they can prove it's there through a, a DNA test, but it was put in to make catch dogs. And they're probably over time going to get away from that due to their hunting rights and their, and their hunting laws and their dog laws. Do you see, do you, do you foresee the boys like in Lithuania or Serbia being coming on board with that is no way. Yeah. No, I don't. I, I think Serbia is like the damn wild west. Oh, it is. They, yeah. I don't think, I don't think they have rules over there. It seems like for me, I'm not going to talk too much about Serbia, but the stuff I've seen, I'm just like, wow, it just seems a little more, I don't know, third world almost and how they do things. They just go out and do it. Um, but I've, I've seen all sorts of chaos over there, but I mean, they, I think they make hard dogs for sure. And same with, same with Lithuania, they get to hunt everything. Like, I mean, in America, we can't go hunt moose with dogs. We don't, Mm. where can we hunt? Where can we go hunting elk with dogs? You know, um, over there in Lithuania, you get, get five terriers and go catch a moose and then you wade into your dogs and they're hanging on this moose and you whip out a pistol and shoot it, you know, like that's, that's hunting for them. That's, and I, and I respect it. I think it's, it's actually very interesting, but we don't get to have that. And I think Lithuania will be producing and keeping, keeping these dogs moving in that direction. Maybe even as the Germans move in a different direction. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Hunting laws change dogs. And I mean, just think of how laws have changed our country, right? You know, what things, how things used to be versus how things are now. And, you know, if we, if there ever was a ban on a certain type of dog, I mean, how it would change our influence to hunting. I mean, they, that's, that's just all it comes down to, I think, for the Germans and parts of the, but um, Lithuania, I don't see anything. Change. I think the dogs are going to become amazing over there from what I've seen. Yeah, for sure. I've just about anything coming out of Eastern Europe. If uh, they have the right facilities and, and resources, they, they breed good dogs, no matter what kind of dog it is. It seems like. Yeah. Eastern, in some cases anyway. Yeah. And I think Eastern Europe is just, I mean, obviously it's not Western Europe, you know, it's not, it, it, it their laws are different. It really just comes mm-hmm. up in Germany. I mean, a wolf can roll under your, under your farm and kill your sheep. And if you shoot it, you know, you're going to prison. You know, that's, that's Germany. They're, they're, they're different. I mean, I think, you know, parts of America, we've, we've even, I, we've realized like, Hey, with the reintroduction of wolves, I mean, we're, you know, Idaho allows to hunt wolves. Montana allows to hunt wolves there. You know, but Germany is, a, it's a different place, different rules, different control. And I think that'll definitely influence how the dogs are. I've heard many people say that the Yacht Terriers from Germany aren't as good as they used to be. Um, that they've gotten softer or they're not the same as they wish that they were. And I think that's why people talk about Serbian Yacht Terriers or, or Eastern European Yacht Terriers. They still keep them in the direction they were intended to be in. Where do you see your program in, in, in say, five years? What, where do you want it to be? Mm. Well, right now, I think I'm not trying to blow these dogs up completely. Like, I've definitely shared them. I want, I want them to, I, you know, I want people to realize that if they want to bring one in, I can help them out. Like, I'm definitely about community, and I'm about doing things right. And I've put a lot of effort into getting my dogs here and I've spent thousands of euros to get them here. And, you know, at the end of it, I mean, I would like to see these original Haida Terriers from 1971, from Hans Warner, from Carl Hines out here in America, catching, catching wild game or fulfilling a hunting life of some kind or a working life. And, I think for me now, it's, it's just keeping it exclusive and the right people who are, who are going to get into these dogs will get a hold of me and we'll build a friendship. And that's how it's been with my nine buyers. Every buyer that I sold to, you know, I, you know, I can talk to them, I can call them and we can talk dogs and 
it's great. I mean, it's like I got nine friends who have dogs for me in a sense. And, you know, they all love the dogs and they want to, you know, I've got guys who think this is going to be a dog that works from this is going to be a dog they're going to have for a long time. And there's a few of them that are asking me, Hey, could you start looking for a female for me? Are you going to make a litter where I could get a breedable female if I wanted to have one down the road? And so I'm kind of forecasting that out a little bit, but also, you know, I'm about to send a dog down to Florida and she's going to go build a name for herself down there. And she was the mother of my first litter. And I got a, sold a pup to a guy down there and he freaking loves that pup. And, um, it's going to be a, a hog catching dog and I'm going to send his mother down there to go catch hogs with him. And I helped him kind of find two dogs from a guy who imported some in over in New York. And, you know, these dogs are coming about. My goal is really just to help people get the, get the most accurate, authentic versions of them. I think there's tons of awesome working dogs to get. I mean, you can buy mixed bred terriers all across the United States, but if you really want a real Haida terrier, one that comes from lower Saxony and that was part of the initial program there. I, I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for the Germans and I would love to see them succeed in, in making this type or type into a real breed and of hunting dogs. And that's my goal to keep it, keep it German and keep it in line with them. Or at least if I have to go to Lithuania to get a dog, so all those dogs came from Germany too. I will, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put a bunch of dogs out there. That's not my goal yet. I think it's to do this right, Sean. And yeah. Fix, and filter, you know, like I'm still looking at these pups, pups. I, the, the pup that I wanted to keep, I mean, I'm really glad that I didn't keep that pup. I think he's really in the best place for him. I'm, he's a rough dog. He's rougher than his father. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's going to be something very impressive. And he built a name for himself on his little trip down to Texas. I guess the guys down in Texas kind of believe he was 10 months old catching pigs like a pro, but you know, we'll probably have another litter in a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I want to have a gene pool of dogs, but I just don't want to just start throwing things out there and realize, oh man, I jumped, jumped the gun here. Let's, let's do this right. Let's take our time and find the right dogs to put on the ground for what people are wanting and to understand, you know, like maybe the Germans wanted a boar dog, but maybe people here want something like the Lithuanians. I can take it out on moose. I can take it out on coyotes. I can do a lot of different things and kind of seeing how this first litter is developing before I make any sort of obligations to making another. I, I want to see what these dogs are like, you know, at a year old. I, I've got a journal from once I threw this litter and I've drafted just so many notes of what they were like. And I've, I've followed up with buyers multiple times as they've matured and I've written down different characteristics of their dogs and what they've told me maybe flaws are like, hey, this pup was about you know, this pup broke shitty on me a few times over dog food. It didn't like other dogs on its food just to note it, you know, this wool shoot. Like I just, you know, just studying and, and learning through this, you know, I don't want to just breed dogs and for nothing. Right. So right. put it out there. And I think taking time and going over my litter and finding out what was successful and what was not. And, you know, these dogs aren't going to come out perfect. There'd be no fun to hunting dogs if, if they just all came out perfect every time. You know, it's a it's a process to to go through, and I think that's where I am with it. I don't I don't know if it's a five year plan or maybe it's a ten year plan, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're gonna just do it right. We're not gonna put it out there unless we all, you know, who I've sold dogs to already are interested. I I won't make a litter just to make a litter. It would be kind of to run the experiment again. If I have people who are interested, I'll I'll do it. But I'm not. I didn't bring these dogs here just to put them everywhere. I really do enjoy just having them and hunting them. And they're my, you know, they're like my best friends. All right. That's very cool. So, Is there anything that uh, we didn't touch that you'd like to convey? Not sure, man. I think we've talked a lot about the Haida Terrier. I think the Haida Terrier, you know, we've, we've talked about what the combination is. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, it can kind of fluctuate through different lines. Um, mm -hmm. Not to say that, it, you know, I'm, I'm not over here saying a Haida Terrier is only a Haida Terrier from Germany. Those are just the dogs I'm I'm running. Like, they're, they're the mm -hmm. started. I mean, 
I really love hunting dogs. Um, I've seen dogs that were my buddies have made that are just from other dogs of theirs and they're amazing and they're just as valuable and just as handy whether they're a type or a breed or you know they're I'm all about hunting dogs and these hides they there's not a whole lot more to them I think they're they're a dog that's coming about and people are curious and they'll only find out if they get their hands on one or if they get to see one in person and you know, there's a few of my buyers on, on Facebook, and I'm sure somebody might come across them there, and they can get their experience. Um, I'm new to dogs, you know. I'm I'm three and a half years in with with these hunting terriers. I'm, there's guys that I have a dog for me that have been hunting dogs the last 30 years, and for them to tell me that they really like the dog said a lot to me. So, you know, I think we're onto something. Yeah, all I can say is, man, I've spent hundreds of hours. I bet you using Google translate, learning about these dogs because it, you know, it took, it took a lot of time. And I went over to Germany and I've hunted flipping off Mm -hmm. their canals for boar with these dogs out there in in Northern Germany with them. And I got to see the different lines. I've seen different kennels. I've looked at the different structure of different man hunters, dogs, and I've, I've narrowed it down to what I think are the dogs that are going to be personally for me most successful here i mean there's a guy named arn polmeyer and he he makes awesome hunting dogs his dog aaron and sally was probably one of the most famous hide terrier throws to ever happen if you let's see a pedigree with aaron and sally it's that's you know that those two dogs are amazing hunting dogs um they were they're called they're they're, they're labeled as um leading dogs in the program and foundational dogs um there's Walter, there's Ingo, there's Andreas, um, there's Steinhoffel, Juniman. Um, there's multiple different people with these dogs, but um, then there's a ton of people who are just trying to do it themselves. And I think it's most important to verify what's really been successful and not to tell a guy to not go make his own dogs, but are clearly making and putting a lot of effort into making these dogs and they're working and i i just want to see them succeed and and making hype and making it universal and not losing the, the performance these dogs have that's critical if they're going to make a breed out of it that's amazing performance. let's not lose that and um yeah i hope it works and for now like i'm just going to continue to hunt them and and make core memories and continue it and if anyone's interested in a dog they can call me and write me on facebook and you know if you're interested i can go pick up a dog for you i can get you contact in contact with the germans and depending on what you need and that's i just want to be a resource to help others i mean so i'm here for it